Okay, I want first to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this uh, unusual meeting. Uh, I will present uh, some of my results on the uh, project on uh, human memory that I'm uh, working on for the last several years. Uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, uh, Michelangelo Naim, uh, Miksha Katkov and Antonios Georgiou from the Weizmann Institute and Sandra Romani uh, from the Janilia uh, Farm. Uh, so what I'm trying to uh, do in this project is uh, to describe uh, some of the classical results in human memory that I will shortly present to you. Uh, with some simple mathematical models. And the idea is that we want to explore to, which to, to what extent human memory uh, can actually be predicted by, by mathematical equations. So uh, if you, just to give you some more general uh, motivation and introduction to this, uh, human memory uh, is of course a very extremely important uh, thing for us, uh, but the difficulty in studying it is that it's an extremely diverse phenomena. And in particular, there are many types of memory and many processes that uh, uh, have to occur in order for the memory to work properly. And uh, uh, this is some uh, uh, graph from a review on uh, on, on memory that uh, that emphasizes that memory has different processes that are, have to work one after the other. So the memory has to be acquired, uh, consolidated, kept for some time, and then retrieved. So, uh, in a sense, the, at least at the very simplest uh, level of uh, discussing this, the, there should be three processes then, uh, uh, which is acquisition, uh, maintenance, and, and recall. So if, if you think about some real life situations, uh, let's say if you're attending a lecture and you want uh, to remember it for some time and then maybe to, uh, to dis discuss uh, later or tell uh, somebody later what uh, the lecture was about, then uh, you have uh, to do three things. You have to uh, listen carefully to the lecture to internalize it, so to acquire this information and code it in the brain. You have to keep it for some time, prevent it from uh, forgetting. And then uh, you uh, have to, to retrieve the information that you maintained in order to recollect this experience. And all of these uh, processes uh, are not uh, uh, are really hard to capture uh, exactly and then not always work. So for example, uh, obviously if you are like, distracted and uh, not really interested in the topic, then you may not even acquire the information well or you're not paying attention. So this is a very well known effect. If you are thinking about something else, obviously you will not uh, uh, acquire the information. But even la at later stage, if you, let's say, listen carefully to my lecture, but then maybe you just forget it because there are other lectures that you may uh, listen to or some other things that you do. And then uh, after some time, uh, you may or may not completely forget uh, what I was talking about. And then finally, at the very last stage, even if you remember my lecture, it could be that you just simply cannot recall it, right? Something happens that you... Uh, cannot recall it, even though you may be perfectly still uh, remembering the lecture. So all of these processes are, as, a, as you know, we all know, are kind of very unpredictable. We don't really know, uh, like, let's say about acquisition, we kind of understand uh, what is what are the necessary conditions for this, but we don't really know why some things we remember for a very long time, some things we forget quickly. And we don't know uh, why uh, sometimes the retrieval of information is also a challenging thing. 
so it seems like uh, there is no real hope that we can write some equation that would describe this process. Also, the quantification of this process is not exactly uh, uh, trivial because uh, if we are thinking about uh, real life uh, information, then it's hard to quanti uh, uh, quantitatively uh, say how well you actually uh, remembered something. So in order to overcome these uh, issues, psychologists developed some classical paradigm of studying memory that uh, uh, allow one to to do things much more in much more controlled and quantif quantified way. And the, and the main uh, trick for doing this is to consider the information that doesn't really have a meaning. So to, to do away with the meaning. Uh, uh, and uh, one particular, uh, the, the classical uh, choice of such a material is the list of uh, uh, randomly assembled words. So if you just uh, choose randomly words, let's say nouns, and put them in a list, uh, then this information has no meaning, right? Unless there is some uh, coincidence, uh, uh, they don't form any, any meaningful message. This is just a random collection of words. So each word has a particular meaning. So uh, if, it's, uh, if you know the language, of course, every word means something. But together, as a list, uh, there is no uh, no message. So, uh, if you study the memory based on, on the on this list, then you completely did away with all the information. You are just uh, quanti you, you are just remembering practically nonsense. On the other hand, this the memory for such a, a list can be very easily quantified. So, so. Uh, uh, so, so basically, if we want to apply this kind of uh, sequential uh, characterization of memory, we can uh, uh, ask uh, how many words you uh, acquire when you listen to the list. To the list. Let's say if I'm reading aloud the, the list of some number of words, some of them you acquire, some of them you, you may simply miss because you may, let's say, think of something or you may just uh, maybe blink or something may happen. So one question you can ask is how many words you actually acquired at all and how many you missed. Then the second question you can ask how many words you remember after the whole list is presented. And then the third question is how many words you can recall. And, and there are paradigms for uh, estimating all of these things. So I will uh, mostly focus uh, on the last link in this uh, triad. So uh, in this talk, uh, I will tell you uh, about whether we can quantitatively describe uh, uh, this uh, last link, so the recall. So this is uh, the model that I will present to you will be the model of recall. So what we will want to know uh, is how many words uh, you remember after uh, you, you listen to the list, and then how many of these remember to what you end up recording. So what are the paradigms to experimentally measure these things? So uh, the paradigm for, uh, for measuring the, uh, the uh, member, mem memory itself is the, uh, uh, it's called the recognition paradigm. So in this paradigm, uh, the subjects uh, are presented with a list and then they ask to recognize uh, a word from the list. So uh, the simplest way to do it is to choose a, a word from the list, let's say a creature in this case, and then pair it with, a, with another word, some distracting word, monument that was not in the list, and then the subject has to point to a word that was in the list. And so the idea of this technique is that uh, if the subject remembers that the word creature was in the list, so he will give a correct answer. And if he is not remembering, so if the word creature was forgotten, then he is faced with two words that are both uh, seem new to him and he will just give a random answer. So by analyzing the results of this uh, recognition experiments, you can calculate uh, how many words uh, in the, in the list, uh, uh, the subject remember after the presentation. 
Okay, so please uh, ask me if anything here is uh, uh, unclear, then uh, uh, please um, ask me a question. So you don't have to wait uh, to the end. Uh, okay. Uh, and I want actually to ask you if, if, if people can see my pointer. So if I can use the pointer to point. Can somebody tell me? Yes, we see your pointer. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, now, uh, uh, so this is the paradigm of recognition. And then this, the, another paradigm in order to measure the recall is uh, very simple. Instead of uh, presenting you the words uh, I'm just asking you, uh, asking you to recall as many words as you can. So the subject is presented with a list of words, and then he is just asked to recall all of them in any order. Uh, and then uh, by simply counting how many words uh, the subject recalls, I know I, I can quantify the recall at this point. Okay, so these are two paradigms that are usually uh, done separately. Uh, which, uh, which are two ways to quantify how well uh, the subject uh, performed this memory task. And the main results, uh, so this is a, actually a very old field, this uh, uh, studying uh, human memory in this way. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, central results that was obtained long time ago is that uh, uh, Recall is a more difficult task than recognition. So basically, people cannot recall all the words that they remember. So it means that the gap between the memory and recall uh, is quite significant, and it's and it's growing when the list becomes longer. So the longer the list is, the bigger the gap is between uh, the number of words that people can remember and the number of words that people can recall. So I'll show you one of the very uh, old, but uh, and one of the benchmark, uh, one of the famous uh, papers in the field uh, back in 1973. This is a, a comparison between recognition and recall uh, in different experiments. So this is a compilation, a comparison of the published uh, papers on, on memory and recall. So what you show, what you see here is that uh, uh, L is the number of words that was in the list. So this is the study of uh, lists of different lengths, up to thousands of words. And here you have two plots. Uh, uh, one, uh, this, uh, the one that is uh, uh, delineated by the uh, red ellipse is the uh, summary of the studies of the recall. So people who measured how many words uh, are recalled on average for lists of increasing length. And you see when the uh, uh, list becomes longer and longer, uh, the number of words is growing. So there is no fixed limit to how many words people can remember, can recall, but it's growing in a sublinear way. And uh, uh, if you compare it to the number of words that people remember, which is this, this uh, solid line, you see that there is a, a big back gap that grows big and big. And actually recognition works quite well. So even in the list of thousands of words, the people can uh, basically recognize a lot of this word. So the, the memory, memory for words works very well, but the recall starts failing and uh, the gap is becoming bigger and bigger. Right? And also uh, because the, the data, data kind of can be well summarized by the straight lines in the logarithmic plot. So this points to some kind of uh, power law relations between uh, memory and recall. Uh, so uh, let me now show you how uh, our approach to uh, modeling these results. So, uh, uh, so again, the model is uh, the goal of the model that I will present to you will be to try to predict uh, how uh, how many words people can recall if we know how many words they remember, right? So how to recall R if, if we know M. Right? Let's say if I present a list of, let's say 400 words, and if I know, if I can measure uh, that, let's say that out of these 400 words, 
uh, people remember 200, how can I predict from here that the number of recall words in this case will be roughly somewhere in the middle between 10 and 40, right? So can we actually uh, make a quantitative prediction, a mathematical prediction for these results before you do the experiments on this? So uh, you need to, in order to, uh, to generate these predictions, obviously you have to assume something about how the recall process works. So how do people recall uh, the words? And uh, uh, so we need to assume something about how the words or any other memory items are encoded in the brain and how the recall process uh, works. So regarding the encoding, uh, so there are many uh, uh, standard schemes for how people believe that uh, memory items are encoded. So one of them assumes that uh, every memory item is encoded as a, uh, some population of neurons, uh, which are uh, randomly, uh, randomly generated and uh, sparse. So this means that if you have a network of neurons that are encoding a certain type of memory, so each particular one will be encoded by a, a small fraction of randomly chosen neuron from this network. Right, so mathematically, we can describe this by binary vectors uh, psi, uh, uh, zero and one. Uh, so the size of this, the length of this each vector is n, which is the number of neurons. And the, number, uh, the upper index uh, labels the items in the memory. And the sparseness of representation means that uh, uh, the average fraction of neurons in the network that are encoding each particular item mu uh, is this parameter f, which is much less than one. Okay, so this uh, was proposed long time ago, and it, it was actually proposed uh, in the framework of the Hopfield model for associative memory. So uh, um, this is my old paper back in 1988, where I showed with my PhD advisor at the time, uh, Misha Feigelman, that uh, this type of encoding uh, is beneficial for uh, maximizing the capacity of the whole film model. So if you, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the sparse and random encodings of memory is uh, maximizing the capacity of the whole film model in terms of how many uh, items you can store in the network. So in order to generalize this uh, model and make it a model of recall, you need to uh, add another uh, element, which is the, how the network can by itself uh, transit from one uh, memory attractor to another, right? Because the problem of the recall, as I am going to propose here, is that there is no specific queue that allows you to recall a word. And so the only way uh, the network can recall uh, multiple words is that to use the one word that is already recalled as a trigger uh, for recalling the next word. So in, in other words, the network has to uh, constantly jump from one attractor to another, and that's how uh, people can recall multiple words from the list. So in order to uh, generate these transitions, uh, you need some extra mechanism. And so one particular idea that you could uh, implement here is to, to, to generate, uh, to add the uh, feedback inhibition, the global feedback inhibition of the strength that is oscillating in time. So if you have a inhibition that is uh, 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 oscillating, so getting uh, stronger and weaker, so you can uh, set up the parameters in such a way that uh, uh, when the inhibition is strong, uh, the attractors become unstable. And so the network converges to a state which corresponds to the overlaps between different attractors, so a smaller number of active neurons. And then when the inhibition is going down again, this can uh, fall into the next attractor, right? So this way it can go, it can transit from one attractor to the next. So if, you, if uh, when we simulated this network, so this is just to illustrate how this uh, uh, mechanism works. So this is a network where there are 16 embedded attractors and you start from uh, attractor number one, and then you see how uh, making this uh, inhibition to oscillate 
the network undergoes uh, transitions from one attractor to the next. And then the interesting thing is that it's uh, uh, even uh, if you wait a very long time, uh, not all of the attractors are retrieved. But rather what happens is that the network uh, 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 converges to a cycle, so a limit cycle solution where it continuously retrieves the same set of attractors, but never retrieves other attractors, as, as you can see in this, in this uh, picture. Moreover, it turns out that you can very well predict uh, in advance which attractor will be uh, retrieved and in which order if you look at the uh, overlaps between the attractors. So if you, if you count how many neurons uh, are in the overlap between these attractors, so you have this matrix of uh, overlap or intersections. Uh, so it turns out that uh, uh, almost all of the transitions happen to the attractors uh, were with the largest overlap to the current one. So if, let's say, if you look at the attractor one and look at the intersections of this attractor with all other attractors, the largest uh, one will be with attractor 16. So the transition will be to, to attractor number 16. Then from six, attractor 16, the largest overlap will be to the attractor nine. So the, the transition will be to the nine. And then if you continue, like let's say, if you look at the attractor nine, the largest overlap will be to attractor 16. So, uh, uh, but you can prevent the, this uh, going back uh, this uh, very short loop between uh, two attractors by introducing some adaptation. So uh, the network cannot go back to the attractor 16. So if you look for the second largest attractor, in this case will be attractor 12. So the next overlap will be to attractor 12. Okay, so this means that if you would know exactly how uh, these attractors, so you would know exactly uh, uh, which attractors will be uh, retrieved and in which order. So you would predict uh, in this case uh, to which cycle uh, this uh, process will converge. So this means that you actually don't, don't even need to simulate the network and you don't even need to consider the neural network, but you can uh, go back to this uh, 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 picture of representations, the presentations com calculate the matrix of uh, intersections or overlaps. Uh, we call it a similarity matrix because it reflects the similarity between the attractors. And then you can uh, simply use the matrix in order to uh, uh, predict uh, the retrieval, right? So in this case, let's say in this, this cartoon case, uh, if you have four, four uh, words in the list, it will uh, immediately converge to a cycle of three words and will never retrieve the, the last word. So in this case, out of four words, this will retrieve three. Okay, so uh, another way to visualize this thing is that we have the matrix of overlaps, uh, we, uh, or similarity matrix S, which has a size M by M, where M is the number of words that uh, people remember, the subject remember after the list is presented. You, in each row of this matrix, you find the biggest element, which is uh, marked by a black spot, and the next, uh, biggest element which is marked by a red spot. So in every row you have uh, black and red spots. And then you use this uh, black and red spots to put the errors, the errors in this graph. So in this graph you put all the attractors as a node on the graph. And then you uh, put an error between the graphs uh, according to this uh, black and red spot. So you put the black spot according to the black, uh, black, black arrow, according to the black spot in the matrix and red arrow, according to the red spot in the matrix. Now you can uh, uh, take the graph, uh, begin with a particular node and simply follow the arrow. So you follow the black arrow if you can. So let's say from the uh, node number one, uh, you uh, move to the node number 14. Then from node number 14, the black arrow would, would put you back to one. So you switch to the red arrow, you go to node number 10. 
then again you follow red uh, arrows to go to seven to six then black arrow goes back to, to the node 12 continue to node 16 go back to node number 10 that you already visited before so now uh, the interesting uh, feature of this model is that now that you went back to the node number 10 you can take the black arrow and then uh, go back in the opposite direction to the previous trajectory so you you go to the node 14 you go back to node number one you continue to 13 so you do this kind of uh, set of black and red transitions and eventually you always uh, converge to a, to a cyclic uh, trajectory right so no matter uh, where you begin this process eventually you you uh, converge to a cyclic trajectory and uh, uh, this will uh, so all of this uh, uh, trajectory including the approach and the cyclic trajectory tells you how many uh, words uh, uh, you recall and how many words uh, they'll never be recalled right so in this case in this example uh, there will be four words uh, no one two three four five uh, words that are not recalled out of 16 so this means that uh, uh, the model recalls 11 words out of 16 and uh, cannot recall uh, five or actually there is another word that i missed so there, there will be 10 recalled words and and, and six words that are not recalled Right. So for every realization of these attractors, uh, you can, uh, and for any initial uh, uh, word, you can uh, uh, predict uh, this way. Uh, if you know, of course, the representations, this vector size, you can predict how many words are recalled and how many words are not recalled. Now, of course, we don't know uh, the representations, so we cannot really predict uh, the result of each experiment exactly, but if we know the statistics of the encodings, we uh, can uh, analyze the statistics of these uh, graphs. Uh, and we may want to calculate uh, what is the average uh, number of words that are recalled, right? Because this is what uh, experimentally people measure. So we can uh, predict, uh, if, we, if, we, if we can solve this problem uh, mathematically, we can predict that on average, uh, the length of these trajectories uh, will be a certain uh, number uh, for any arbitrary uh, size of the graph. So for any arbitrary number of words uh, that are known. So if we can do this, then we can make these predictions. Uh, so this was the first uh, uh, paper that we published in this uh, 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 for this project, so uh, uh, I'll just give you the result because this is quite a complex calculation. Uh, but you can uh, go and check it, check this paper where uh, this derivation is presented. So, uh, so what we managed to uh, achieve in this paper is to calculate the asymptotic uh, solution to this problem. So when uh, the size of the graph is large enough, so if m is becoming big you can calculate the average uh, uh, length of this trajectory so average number of recalled words as a function of m and the result looks like a power law relation so this provides a genetic explanation for the uh, very old experimental results about the power law uh, of recall uh, with a coefficient uh, that we cannot calculate, but the power uh, that the exponent that can be calculated uh, analytically as a function of the sparseness parameter of the encoding model. So uh, alpha is given by this simple form. So this means that uh, uh, if the representation becomes sparser and sparser, uh, the, uh, the recall is uh, uh, becoming better and better. And the best possible scaling relation is the square root relation so if the if the encoding is very sparse uh, uh, then the the number of words that can be recalled uh, scales as a square root uh, as the number of words that that uh, that are remembered with a coefficient that can only be calculated on average Okay, so this is a very powerful thing, which means that uh, uh, generically uh, these models 
uh, reproduce the power law relations. And it also explains why uh, when the number of uh, words becoming uh, bigger, the gap between the recall and the and memory is growing, right? Because simply these trajectories uh, becomes relatively shorter relative to the size, total size of the graph. Uh, the length of this trajectory becomes smaller and smaller. And that's why, so, so the, the limit cycle that this approach that is achieved here becomes shorter and shorter compared to the size of the, of the graph. Again, the details of these calculations can be found in this uh, paper. Uh, as I told you, the, uh, so, so we have in a sense a similar situation to the Hotel model. The sparser representation is the better uh, the recall. And in particular, if this, this representation becomes very sparse, uh, the model simplifies. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can actually solve it exactly. And the reason why the model simplifies is uh, that this matrix of similarities, which uh, for some arbitrary value of F has uh, non-trivial correlations between different elements, uh, these correlations uh, disappear in the limit of the sparse encoding. So that's a very easy thing to, to check. And so in this limit, you can consider this matrix as simply a completely random symmetric matrix. So if the matrix is completely random and symmetric one, uh, there is an exact solution to this problem, uh, where the, the length, the average length of this retrieval trajectory uh, converges to a square root of uh, M, but the coefficient now can be calculated exactly as square root of three pi over two, which is approximately the number of, uh, a little bit bigger than two. Okay, so if we believe that the encoding in the brain is sparse, so we can actually precisely calculate the average number of words that can be recalled uh, if we know how many words uh, are in memory. And this is then in the situation where the words are completely randomly chosen. So there is no uh, meaning to this information. Obviously, there is some, uh, if the words constitute a certain meaningful method, uh, I will comment on this uh, at the end of my lecture, then obviously people can recall more. But if there is, a, if there is no message, uh, uh, then the, the recall should uh, satisfy this uh, simple analytical equation. So the question is, uh, uh, do we really believe that this, uh, can, can we really uh, believe that this kind of simple equations can uh, be, uh, uh, can hold uh, for people? And the, the problem, uh, why this may sound like a very uh, surprising uh, idea is that uh, simply because people, uh, so this would mean that, that you can precisely predict uh, the number of recalled words if you know how many words are remembered. So this means that uh, all the people should uh, uh, have exactly the same uh, recall performance. And we know obviously that this is not true. People have different memories. Moreover, uh, we know that uh, depending on how you present the material, the, you can influence the recall. So there are classical results showing that uh, if the presentation is very quick, the recall uh, becomes more difficult. So how can you reconcile these uh, uh, results with this prediction? So the only way to try to reconcile it is to say that all of these manipulations and all of this in individuality in the memory uh, is uh, summarized uh, in, in the M variable. So uh, let's say people who have a good memory, uh, they will remember more words than people who have bad memories. But if we match them uh, by how many words they remember, they will uh, end up recalling uh, the same number of words. Okay, so this would be uh, the only way where this universal uh, mathematical equations could actually hold. So I will now show you the results of the experiments that uh, we did in order to try to, to confirm or falsify this prediction. So let me uh, skip the mathematical derivation. So how would you uh, test these uh, predictions? Uh, the way to test them is to independently measure uh, R and N, basically. Or in other words, to, in the, to, to do both type of experiment that I uh, introduced to you at the beginning of my talk on the same people under identical conditions. 
so that's what we did. We uh, went to the uh, internet platform, uh, which is called Mechanical Turk, that allows you to do experiments in, over the internet without having uh, bringing people to the lab. And we did the experiments on this on, on a group of. So now you can we can collect a large number of. Uh, subjects uh, and each subject did two experiments he did one recall experiment where we measure the number of words that they could recall in the lists of uh, a certain length uh, presented at a certain speed and then we did a one re uh, recognition experiment uh, on the list on the, of the same length and the same presentation speed so we matched exactly the condition of the experiments and then we have a group of subjects uh, that do these experiments for different conditions. Uh, and then we can calculate uh, this uh, uh, R and M variables independently. And then we, we can then see if plotting R versus M, uh, if uh, uh, our prediction can be confirmed. And so we have, uh, uh, this is the idea. So these are the results for the recognition experiment. This confirms again that recognition, that the number of words that people remember depends on the number of words that are presented in the list and on the presentation condition. So for faster presentation, uh, the fewer words are remembered, but if the list becomes longer, then more words are remembered. Uh, so this is just confirming that we are like we are doing everything correctly and uh, this, uh, um, all these uh, results are, are satisfied. But then if we do the recall experiments and we measure R as a function of L and presentation speed, we can then plot uh, R versus M, recognition versus memory. And then there is a very precise match. So this was a, a quite a surprising result for, for me because I, I never really thought that uh, uh, the agreement can be so uh, close. Uh, but you see that for all the conditions that we tried, so we tried seven uh, list lengths from uh, eight to 520 words in the list. Uh, and we tried two presentation speed, one second and 1.5 seconds. So we have 14 conditions overall. So we have 14 data points that we uh, collected. And you see that all of these 14 data points uh, uh, are quite close to the predicted line. The, the predicted relation is this black line, which is the uh, R equal uh, 2.17 times square root of seven. Uh, and this is true even though the, the points are very, very far from each other. So a priori, there would be no, no reason to expect sorry, uh, that, the, the, that all of the results will be close to this predicted line, because we would not, we would not have any a priori reason to believe that uh, we uh, we have this agreement, and I want to emphasize that there is no no uh, no parameters to fit, right? So if if we would have a, uh, there is nothing here in this equation that I can fit in order to to uh, to, to to explain the data, right? So if, if the data would not be close to the predicted line, so this would be immediately obvious for this. Term. So one more experiment that we did is that to see if how, ge how general these results are, because uh, the model is completely generic. It doesn't really assume anything about what kind of uh, memories you have. Uh, so we did uh, another experiment where instead of list of words, we had a list of short sentences, which uh, express uh, well-known facts. So this is uh, some examples of these uh, sentences. Uh, like Earth is a planet, uh, Mexico is a country, etc. So we have a, a big uh, uh, table of these uh, well-known facts. And now we, we do exactly the same experiments, except that uh, we present to subject the list where every item in the list is uh, one of these facts. And now when they recall the, uh, the list, they have to recall the facts, and we want to check uh, how many facts uh, they recall. So if our uh, assumption that uh, uh, is correct, then the number of uh, facts that they recall should be exactly the same statistically as the number of words in the previous experiment. So overall, they will recall many more words uh, than in the previous experiment because uh, every fact is expressed in, in terms of several words. 
And indeed, this is uh, what we get. So we have this uh, blue curve, which represents, uh, the, that uh, summarizes the results of our experiments. And you see that even uh, for, for, the, for, for the facts, there is practically no difference between list of words and list of facts. So this uh, prediction is completely generic, apparently, and will work for any other uh, types of material. Uh, so finally, just uh, uh, if I have a couple of more minutes, I want to give you some uh, uh, directions to where I think this uh, uh, project should can, can continue. So as I mentioned in the beginning, obviously, uh, this is a, all these uh, derivations only work for a meaningless materials, so only completely random list of words that has no message. And if there is a message, then uh, people can recall more words. So this is uh, uh, well known from uh, uh, some old uh, uh, papers in psychology where uh, they studied these issues quantitatively. So uh, for example, if you have a, let's say a list of 20 words, uh, you can ask how many words of this uh, uh, list people can remember. So this is a percentage of recalled words. And then you can make the list more and more meaningful and the, the more and more kind of similar to the uh, actual uh, language. And the way you do it is to generate statistical correlations between the words. You, you, you have a words that people actually use when they speak. So, uh, and you can make these correlations uh, more and more uh, of higher and higher order. So let's say order two means that the, uh, the subsequent couple of uh, uh, pairs of words are generated from natural speech, uh, triples of words, etc., up to uh, the, the text, the real text. And you see the more, uh, the more uh, correlations you introduce, the, the more you approach the behavior of the text, uh, even though uh, not monotonically, but uh, monotonically increasing, but with, with this kind of saturated behavior. So these are uh, old uh, papers by 1950, so we don't really have a, 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 a data from this, just this graph. So we, uh, we wanted to see what, how, how actually, uh, what's going on when you introduce this uh, correlation. How, how do people recall the, uh, this list when they're not just random, uh, non-central list, but uh, have some kind of correlations between the words. So we repeated these experiments. Uh, and then we found an interesting uh, result. So we found that when, the, when you introduce this correlation, uh, indeed people recall more words on average, uh, but they also recall them in a completely different way. So this is a, a, a set of recalls. So uh, what we show here, so this is, let's say, random words, uh, and these are people who are recalling the words in, in order according to how well they recall the words. So let's say the first subject recall only two words, then the next one recall three words, etc. up to the last one that recalls 12 words out of 16. But we also have a color code here which shows uh, uh, for each recalled words, uh, what was its position in the list, okay, from blue to yellow. And so you see that in this case where the words are randomly assembled, uh, it's quite uh, uh, understandable that also the order of the recall is quite random. So people recall these words in random order. So this is the list of uh, words where, uh, which uh, have a, a pairwise statistics of language. And you see already that there is some structure emerging. But there is a very dramatic uh, change when you go to triplets because uh, there is a whole subgroup of uh, people who now recall the words in a, in, in a precise order. So they, uh, instead of having this random uh, distribution of colors, they recall them from the first to the last. And these are the people who recall most of the words. So uh, it appears that uh, uh, introducing of these correlations allow people to overcome this uh, randomness uh, in the words representation and now uh, uh, recall them as one chain or one kind of sequence of words. So, and this apparently happens as a sudden transition. So there is some kind of bifurcation in this process 
which allows some people to to switch from one mode of recall, which is this random recall, uh, to a sequential recall. And so I think uh, what we are trying to understand now is how how this this transition, this sudden transition from random recall to sequential recall, can come about uh, under some conditions. Uh, but uh, let me uh, just to uh, uh, summarize to just to remind you that. Uh, the main result of this project is this uh, surprising simple relation between the recall and memory uh, that uh, we confirmed experimentally to, to quite a surprising precision. Thank you. So now if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.